The Wind Is My Mother by Bear Hart and Molly Larkin. Book One, Initiation. To Walk in Beauty. When I was three days old, my mother took me to a hilltop near our home and introduced me to the elements. First, she introduced me to the four directions, east, south, west, and north. I'm asking special blessings for this child. You surround our lives and keep us going. Please protect him and bring balance into his life. Then she touched my tiny feet to this Mother Earth. Dear Mother and Grandmother Earth, one day the child will walk, play, and run on you. I will try to teach him to have respect for you as he grows up. Wherever he may go, please be there supporting and taking care of him. I was introduced to the sun. Grandfather, son, shine upon this child as he grows. Let every portion of his body be normal and strong in every way, not only physically, but mentally. Wherever he is, surround him with your warm, loving energy. We know that there will be cloudy days in life, but you are always constant and shining. Please shine through to this child and keep him safe at all times. She lifted me up to be embraced by a breeze as she spoke to the wind. Please recognize this child. Sometimes you will blow strong. Sometimes you'll be very gentle. But let him grow up knowing the value of your presence at all times as he lives upon this planet. Next, I was introduced to the water. Water, we do not live without you. Water is life. I ask that this child never know thirst. She put some ashes on my forehead saying, fire, burn away the obstacles of life for this child. Make the way clear so that he will not stumble in walking a path of learning to love and respect all of life. And that night I was introduced to the full moon and the stars. These elements were to watch over me as I grew up, running around on the carpet of grass that my mother and grandmother provided, breathing in the air that sustains life and flows within my body, taking away all the toxins as I exhaled. I had a sense of belonging as I grew up because of my people's relationship with these elements, and I imagine that's why most of our people related to the environment so easily. We recognized a long time ago that there was life all around us in the water, in the ground, in the vegetation. Children were introduced to the elements so that as we grew up, we were not looking down upon nature or looking up to nature. We felt a part of nature on the same level. We respected each blade of grass, one leaf on a tree among many other leaves, everything. My name is Nokus Feki Amantha Tustanki. In your language, it means bare heart. I'm also known as Marcellus Williams, and I was born in the state of Oklahoma in 1918. My tribe is Muskogee, and we originally lived along the waterways of what is now Georgia and Alabama. The Europeans who eventually settled in that area did not know of us as Muskogeans. They simply referred to us by our habitat, the Indians who live by the creeks. The name prevailed, so we are commonly known as Creek Indians, but in fact, we are Muscogee Nation. In 1832, President Andrew Jackson signed an order to remove the native tribes from the southeastern United States. 
and it was then that the Muscogee were moved along with the Chickasaws, Choctaws, and Cherokees. We walked all the way from our homes to Indian Territory, which later became Oklahoma. That's a Choctaw word meaning land of the red man. History has recorded that removal, but never once have the emotions been included in that record. What our people felt, what they had to leave behind, the hardships they had to endure. The removal was forced. We were given no choice about it. When our people refused to leave their homes, soldiers would wrench a little child from the arms of his mother and bash his head against a tree saying, go or we'll do likewise to all the children here. It said that some of the soldiers took their sabers and slashed pregnant women down front, cut them open. That's how our people were forced from their homeland. Our people walked the entire distance from sun up to sundown, herded along by soldiers on horseback. When our old people died along the way, there was no time allowed to give them a decent burial. Many of our loved ones were left in ravines, their bodies covered with leaves and brush because our people were forced to go on. It was a long walk. People got very tired, and the young children could not keep up with the adults. So people would carry them, handing them back and forth, but they didn't have the endurance to carry them all the time. So some children and their mothers had to be left behind. Those are just some of the hardships our people endured on that walk. And out of those injustices came much lamenting and crying, so our people called it the Trail of Tears. I knew a man who went on that long walk as a child and he told me about it. At one point the people and a few horses that they had were put on 12 dilapidated ferry boats to cross the Mississippi River. The ferry started sinking, so he grabbed his little sister, got on a horse, and headed for shore, all the while chased by soldiers who didn't want him riding. He was trying to hurry, but the horse had to swim and was frightened from the commotion. So was slow going. He had seen how brutal the soldiers could be and how the fairies were intentionally overloaded to make them sink. So he was making a break for his life. Someone came up behind him on another horse and grabbed the sister. I was crying when I got to the shore, he said, because I thought the soldiers took my sister, but I found out later one of my own people had helped me out. Many of our people died crossing the Mississippi. When the survivors got across the river, many were soaked from swimming, and it was freezing cold. One old woman, confused and exhausted from the ordeal, had no idea where she was. She thought she was back home and started giving instructions to the young ones. Follow that trail and where it forks, there are some dry sticks on the ground. Gather them and build a fire to warm the people. She remembered where to find firewood at home, and in her own mind, she thought she was there. Surely, she wished to be there. My great-great-grandmother was on that forced march. No matter what kind of weather, they had to go on, and walking in the snow without any shoes, her feet froze. Gangrene set in and her feet literally dropped from her legs. She's buried at Fort Gibson, Oklahoma, but there's no name on those markers, just many, many crosses where our people died without recognition. I don't know where her grave is, but she's there among them. Even after we were settled, that was not the end of our problems. Our children were taken from their parents and forced to go to boarding school where they were not allowed to speak their native tongues. They had to speak English. The boarding school was a government school, so they had to march to and from class, make up their beds, do everything as if 
It were a military camp. This was forced upon our young children. Back then, native people took pride in their long hair, but the children had to have their hair cut short. Sometimes the administrators would just put a bowl over the child's head and cut around it. Then they would laugh at the child. Those are just some of the things that were we endured. And yet today, in our ceremonies, many of our people still pray for all mankind, whether they be black, yellow, red, or white. How is it possible, with a background like that among our people, to put out such love? I grew up in the country three miles of what is now Okama, Oklahoma. The Creeks didn't live on reservations when they were settled in Indian Territory. Each member of our tribe was given 180 acres by the government, and my family lived on my mother's original allotment. My mother was nearing the end of her childbearing years when I came on the scene, so there was quite an age gap between my brothers and sisters and me. As a result, I had no close brothers to play, hunt, or get into all kinds of mischief with. I more or less grew up alone with my father and mother and got into mischief by myself. My family thought I was going to be a singer at one time. My older brother even had a conservatory of music picked out for me. But because he had chosen it for me, I didn't want to go. I wanted to do my own choosing, do what I felt good about. I guess I was just a little rascal from a very early age always trying to do my own thing and to make up my own mind. I didn't want to be little brother. I attended a country school about a mile and a half from home and walked to school every day until I got a Shetland pony and rode. I used to ride horses all the time and loved to practice the trick riding I saw in the rodeo. Some days I'd come back from school standing up on the horse, who'd be just galloping away. My mother used to get after me. You're going to fall off sometime. I just said, I'll probably hurt myself, won't I? Next time, I'll be riding backwards on the horse, or I'd be galloping along and I'd jump off and hit the ground and run, hanging on to the saddle horn. The momentum of that would lift me up to the other side of the horse. I saw the trick riders on the rodeos do something called the barrel roll, where they'd go under the horse and come up on the other side while the horse was still running. I practiced that out on our cotton field and hit the dirt many times, but eventually was able to do it. All the farm kids worked a lot and were strong, but somehow I was able to get everyone else down and was considered the best wrestler in school. I used to run everywhere I went out for track and practiced running through the cornfield without touching a stalk, just starting back and forth. We lived three miles from Okama, and when I went to town, I'd jump off the porch and start running and never stop until I got there. Then I'd run back. One time, my father found an iron pipe on the side of the road, which had fallen off a truck, probably on its way to one of the many oil fields being built around Okama. The pipe just fit between the forks of two trees in front of our house, so we put it across and I tied a rope to it. I used to climb that rope with my hands up and down, up and down. In addition to giving those horses a lot of exercise, I would feed the hogs and chickens tend the vegetable gardens, milk the cow, and help my mother turn the milk into butter. There's never a good time to milk a cow. When I milked summer, the cow would swish the tail to get the flies away and hit me across the face. And no matter how cold it was, I'd still have to milk. I guess that's why the cow jumped over the moon one time. Cold fingers. We had smokehouse where we cured hams and salted down pork. And I remember bumblebees taking over the inside of our smokehouse one time. My dad took part of the roof of a shingle, only as wide as his hand, and without a shirt on, walked into the smokehouse and shoot all the bumblebees out of there. 
I don't know why he didn't get stung because he was not a medicine man who had the power to protect himself. He just had a lot of guts. He was that kind of man. I was quite in awe of what he did. So I found some wasps living in a hole in a tree and I stuck my finger in there and let them sting me. Then I took the stingers out. It hurt for a while, kind of like getting a shot, but I got used to it. Sometimes I'd catch wasps and remove their stingers, then hold them and have wasps all over my hand. People didn't know they had no stingers. They'd be really impressed. I guess I was about 10 then. I used to do crazy things. One day, uh, one of my school buddies wanted to trade sandwiches with me. My mom used to make me good meat sandwiches and my friend had only a bologna sandwich, but I traded him anyway. I ate the bologna, but first I pulled off the skin and saved it. On the way home, I could cut off part of that skin wet it down, then pasted it on my face so it looked like a long cut. When I got home, my mother was quite alarmed, crying out, Oh, Chibon, son, and throwing her arm around me. When I pulled it off, she tried to scold me, but she was laughing too hard. I was always told to come home before dark. But once, when I was around six or seven, I went to my neighbors and got to playing with their neighbor boy. We had so much fun, it was already dark when I got back. I went to my dad and said, I'm sorry, I forgot your warning about being home before dark. He felt he had to back up his words, so he took a strap, folded it, and whacked me once. It wasn't too hard, but I felt bad that I had caused a father I adored so much to whip me. So I went to my room and cried myself to sleep. A few days later, I overheard my mother telling my older sister what had happened. She said that during the night, my dad had cried too, saying, he came and told me and I still whipped him. I should have accepted his apology. He hardly slept that night, but he had to back up his words so that whenever he told me something, I would listen. I think it hurt him more than it hurt me because I soon forgot about it, but it made me more cautious after that about overstepping the boundaries he set for me. Even though he never gave up practice in our traditional ways, my dad was a Christian and very knowledgeable about the Bible. He'd often read the scripture to me and then ask, what do you think this means? I was only nine years old then but it made me think. He read me a story of Noah sending a raven out from the ark to see if there was any land nearby, but the raven never came back. Then he sent a dove, and the dove brought back an olive branch. That's why you always see the dove with an olive branch in its beak. That's a good story, but what do you think about that? What does it mean? I answered that there are two kinds of people, one kind, when asked to do something, will start out to do it and then go off and get interested in something else. They just go their own way. But then there are others who will think it's a privilege to be asked and they'll want to satisfy the person who asked them as well as themselves by working at a task until it's done, like the dove that came back. He just nodded his head and never said right or wrong because he wasn't particularly interested in the answer. He just wanted to see my logic and how I was putting things together. That's what he was teaching. My mother was a very dedicated Christian and most of her activity outside our home was centered around the All Indian Greenleaf Baptist Church. She was one of the leaders in the women's organization and was kind of the backbone of the church. Yet, she would still work in some of our Indian ways. When the women of the church had meetings, she had them fast before and during their meeting. Then they would eat together afterwards. 
She told me that fasting is a way of connecting to the Great Spirit. They fasted so that there would be no distraction from discussing the spiritual aspects of church activities. I had also heard my parents say our people came to know things by fasting. When I was 10 years old, I still could not read Creek, even though I could speak it fluently, so I decided to fast and asked the Creator to help me learn to read. I took a Creek songbook out into the woods and looked closely at the words and letters as I sang. I did that several times, fasting from evening until two or three the next afternoon, and that's how I learned to read the Creek language. It was easy. My mother was quite a talker too and wouldn't hesitate to address the men and let it be known what was needed in the church. She organized all kinds of things. She got the men to work picking cotton in the summer for some of the local farmers and donated to pay to the church. That was how the church could afford to feed all the visitors when they had big meetings. At Christmas time, she would organize a pecan sale to raise money to buy gifts for all the children of the church. After the last service on Christmas Eve, Santa Claus would come in with a sack of gifts on his back, an Indian Santa Claus who spoke Creek. It was a very jolly time. Planting cotton. My dad taught me to hitch a team of horses to a wagon and plow when I was eight years old. And when I was 10, he gave me two acres of land saying, if you want to plant something, go ahead. If you don't plant anything, let it grow wild. Maybe some rabbits will come. Feed upon the plant life and you can kill a rabbit to have something to eat. It's your choice. Don't let it sit idle. Let it yield nuts. Let it yield something. That's what he was teaching me. So I planted two acres of cotton. It was good cotton, my very own. But I had to work it and do all the plowing. I knew which plowshare to use if I wanted to plow deeper. And I knew how to plow between each row in an attempt to keep the weeds from coming up. I tied the lines to the horses by my back when I hit a rooter a rock under the ground, it would pull me forward and I'd hit the crossbar on the handles of the plow. Often I'd fall, but I'd dust myself off and keep going. When the cotton grew up, I'd check each bowl to see if there were any bull weevils in there. And if there were, we didn't have any spray, but at least we could pray. That's how I tend my two acre cotton patch. I did my best to excel in everything that I tried, but I definitely must say that I was not good at picking cotton. When I picked cotton from each bowl, I'd pick it clean, and that takes a long time. It's stuck in there, and you have to pull. The sharp, dry points of the cotton bowl stick right under your fingernails, and the edge of your fingers get all bloody. Some people could pick two rows of cotton at once one cotton sack on their left side and another cotton sack on their right ambidextrous going down the lines. It would take me about four times as long to finish one row of cotton, just one sack, because I had a lot of cousins living nearby. Then it was time to pick the cotton. I hired them to pick it for me. I was the boss and we all picked the cotton. When each sack was full, I weighed it, recorded the weight next to the person's name, and dumped the cotton in the wagon. When we finished picking, I sold the cotton and paid them all off. I think the going rate for cotton at that time was about eight cents a pound. Afterwards, one of my cousins drove me into town from Okuma to Okmulgee. I paid for the gas. It was just 25 cents a gallon in those days. When we got to Okmulgee, I bought a suede jacket and a new pair of work shoes. Boy, I came out the tallest man in that city because I bought something with money I earned with my own labor at 10 years old.
Not long after that, my dad became very ill, had been bedridden for some time, and one day he called me over and said, Son, I really hate to ask you to do this, but I'm going to ask if you would stay out of school for a while and help your mother around the house. I said yes. I was happy to get out of school anyway. People used to come over and pray for my dad or just visit with him. But as time went on and on, they quit coming, and so it was just my mother and myself. The rest of the family helped us out at the grocery store and gas station. We just signed for our purchases, and my older brother would pay for them. He wasn't a rich man, but he was well off enough financially to take care of us like that. Still, we did without a lot of things. There was no air conditioning back then, and even if there had been, we couldn't have afforded it. I built a brush arbor next to the porch of our house, and in the summer would bring my dad's bed out there. I'd take the wagon to a spring about two and a half miles away and fill two barrels with water. Then I'd come back and sprinkle around his bed and around the shade arbor. That was air conditioning in our day. One hot Saturday afternoon in June, I was on my way to fill the barrels of water from the spring when, at the crossroads, I met two of my buddies from school going to town on horseback. I hadn't seen them for a while because I'd stayed out of school, and I asked if they were going to take in the movie. Oh no, we've been picking cotton, and now we've got some money. Tomorrow is Father's Day, so we're going to get presents for our dads. All I could say was, oh, I couldn't speak, so I went on. I wanted to get something for my dad, too, but I didn't have any money. Didn't even have a penny in my pocket. That's why I couldn't talk. I was too choked up. After getting the water, I came back home and did a lot of little extra things for my dad. I swept out our entire arbor, then I sprinkled on top of the willows that made up the shade for the arbor and I sprinkled around his bedside. I wished there was some way that I could make my dad happy on Father's Day to honor him and give him something special. I thought that maybe if I did a real extra thing, something good would happen and I'd be able to get a present for my dad. But nothing happened. I didn't have much sleep during the night thinking about it. Maybe some tears came too. Morning came and the first thing that I do each day was light the wood stove in my kitchen for my mother. Then I'd get a fresh bucket of water, go get the eggs, milk the cow, and feed the horses. That was my routine every morning. I got all that done and when I came back, my mother just about had breakfast ready for my dad. And the last minute, as my mother was finishing making his breakfast, I had an inspiration. I ran into my room, took a page out of the old chief tablet that I had used at school, and scribbled on it. Dear Dad, you are the most wonderful dad in all the world. I love you very much. Happy Father's Day. Then I signed my name. That's all I could afford. I handed him the tray with the note on it, and he picked up the note and read it. Then he, when he got through reading it, he put his arms up and embraced me. And in that moment of embrace, I felt what a wonderful, blissful place awaits all of us when we cross over from this world. But until then, even a small portion of that greatness awaiting us can be experienced in a little embrace where love is expressed and manifested between parent and child. I often think back over that Father's Day. Many times it carries on me as I look around at all the extended families that I have, reaching for something good and solid to take hold of so that this world might be better for them being here. It's what enables me to do my work at the cost of criticism from my own people, 
for sharing with non-Indians the philosophy, the love, the care of our ancestors. Coming into this world, we didn't choose to be this particular color from this particular culture. We are here, but for what purpose were we sent here? We try to find our role in life, and because of it, we can get glimpses of what it means to walk what we call the spirit road. And when we walk on that spirit road, there is no Catholic, no Jewish, no Buddhist, no Indian way, or any special way. Universal love is gathered together on that one road. The caring and love that can generate from our hearts into the lives of others can carry us forward. My mother was president of the women's organization of the Greenleaf Baptist Church for 25 consecutive years. And when she retired, they made her a lifetime honorary chairperson. During the honoring celebration they held in the church, an old man spoke up and in a speech translated from our tribal language to English, he said, during the years that you have supported this church with your love and acceptance of the great being in your life, you have made many tracks coming to this church. In time, beautiful flowers will grow in your footsteps, indicating a beautiful life lived with God. I always remember that speech, to walk in beauty, have a purpose, strive for its fulfillment, strive to live in harmony and cultivate loyalty, belief, and faith. All of these are ingredients that give substance to a full life. As a child, I was taught Chiban. The way to attain to beauty in life is through harmony. Be in harmony with all the things, but most important, be in harmony with yourself first. A lot will go on in your life, some good, some bad. People may argue and some will try to take control of your life, but that one word, harmony, will neutralize any problems and help you live to become beautiful. Years later, I have people from all walks of life writing to me and many of them end up saying, walk in beauty. I had that early in life when I first started out. Our people walked in beauty.